Good morning all. My name is Arno de Vrede uh, and I work for a consultancy company called OpenVU. And this talk has absolutely nothing to do with what I do at my daily job. This talk has everything to do with my son having too much Lego. So really a first world problem, you might say. Uh, he really likes Lego, he really likes building stuff, he likes to build stuff from the manuals, uh, and also he likes to break stuff, and he got brothers and sisters who also like to break stuff. So we end up with a big box of Lego, really this, this big. So it's really annoying to figure out a box set uh, that he wants, so if, you, if he wants to create a set, I have to dig in that box and figure out all the, the Lego bricks. So. Um, yeah, that, that's going to take me a while to, to do. So if I want to sort out everything, it's going to take me a couple of weekends to do that. Um, so that is a really good excuse to automate this over the past two years. So when I started out this project, I had a, a bit of a conundrum. I had to choose. Do I go to the, uh, to do the hard way, the Java way, or do I go the easy route with machine learning and take Python? Well, as you can see, the, the Java route is on fire, it's broken, it's, well, it's, it's still under construction. But the right side has a, a Python uh, snake on the road, so I really don't like snakes. So I took this road. <laughs> well, I knew nothing about machine learning when I started it. I know a little bit now, but well, uh, I hope to take you along with the journey that I took uh, in the last two years. Uh, on and off on this project, mostly off, because, well, I have four kids and, well, they take a lot of time too. So this is more in the evenings that, well, I don't have anything to do. There aren't lo a, a lot of them, so. So I was greeted with a lot of terminology like loss functions, gradients, uh, hyperparameters, scores, and all kind of sh shenanigans. So I'm going to take you on the journey that I, I took and uh, let's see what we can make of it. Well, in Python, there are a lot of frameworks out there, like Kira, PyTorch, TensorFlow, and all kinds of, of things. So what do we have in Java then? I only took here the frameworks that had a release in the last year and are actually free to use. So we left with uh, Deep Learning for J. This is actually the framework that I started out with uh, two years ago. Then we got Elki, um, but Elki is not for me because this is more like a scientific model if you want to go into mathematicals of models and way too deep for me. So then I came across the Java, uh, deep Java library, and I'm gonna mess this name up quite often, but it supports multiple frameworks underneath, like Apache MNEX, PyTorch, TensorFlow. It looked promising, so uh, when I figured this, this framework out, I did some benchmarks. And I ran these benchmarks on a Amazon machine with a GPU net, uh, but the uh, DGL library, um, uh, actually outperformed the old uh, Deep Learning for J, uh, for J. Deep Learning for J actually got killed by the out of memory killer uh, from Linux, uh, so it really didn't even pass with CPU uh, stuff. So I had to switch frameworks. So it's a bit of annoying. But what about the performance between Java and Python then? Because everybody says if you want to do machine learning, you have to do Python, right? Well, maybe not. I ran some benchmarks uh, with um, an older version of, of uh, TensorFlow in Python, uh, and I took uh, a recent version of uh, PyTorch. And actually, Java is a second faster uh, while training uh, on data than the Python version. So it's not a lot difference, but it is a small difference, and well, I think anything I can get, because this is a long process. Uh, as you can see, this is 64 seconds for a iteration of uh, five Lego bricks. So it's, it's going to take a while. And actually, if I do the same thing, uh, not with training, but actually using the model on a CPU, uh, this benchmark was on my laptop because well, I was testing on that uh, for, for a bit, and I see the same result. Python is a little bit slower than Java. Not by much, but it's cool. But how come that... Python is that fast, because, uh, well, Python is an interpreted language. It, it shouldn't be as fast as Java, right? Well, actually, Python just has a API for TensorFlow, and its API calls a C++ engine underneath. 
And that actually gives us an advantage, because in Java we have that uh, deep Java library that's just an abstraction on top of those uh, other uh, engines. So with that abstraction we can use uh, PyTorch, TensorFlow, MXNet, all kinds of different uh, engines uh, without actually uh, well, swapping stuff. So, and we're actually using the same engine, so the same results should come out. That's uh, really nice. So for the purpose of this, uh, this talk, uh, I'm gonna uh, first focus on how to confuse machine learning with dogs and muffins. Uh, I will get to the Lego in a bit, but this example is a small example which is easy to grasp uh, and a lot faster. So, first off, let's do some exercise. Let's do some confusion for humans. If you can raise your hand if you can see a dog, and if you make a fist if you can see a muffin, there will, uh, uh, there will be an image in the center of the screen that appear very briefly. So what was that? Ooh, I see some switching, and well, this is the power of uh, well the audience. Almost everybody got this correct. This was, was an easy one. There was a little doggy. So what was this? Ooh, I see some confusion already. Most of the people have it correct, but it was this muffin. So next up. It's a bit faster. Ah, this is still going excellent. Almost everybody got the correct one, one or two. Maybe they're just screwing around. So there was this doggy. So what was that? <laughs> was it a mop or was it a dog? Uh, not a lot of hands. 50-50, I think. It was this little doggy. <laughs> this goes to show that if you are not prepared for the image that you are presented with, you just guess. Yep. And that's the same thing with machine learning. If the machine learning doesn't recognize what it's presented with, it just guesses. So how do we train the machine to do this? Well, first off, I need to categorize the dogs and muffins into two categories and do it correctly, because if there is an image wrong in a category, the machine learning will yeah, be not as accurate as it can be. So ensure that you do the, the separations uh, uh, correctly. Well, if you wanted to train a machine learning model on these 16 images, or what, what is it? Then uh, the machine learning model wouldn't uh, be accurate enough, and well, it just doesn't work that well. Plus, it will see the results before if, uh, in, the, in this training set, and that's really the, uh, what we don't want. We want to present the machine learning model while training with new images, and uh, when validating the model, we want to show them images that it's, the model has never seen before. So how, we can do how can we do this? Well, we first go to, uh, uh, to Python for this, because in Python we can just download a lot of internet uh, images with Google. Uh, we can download 2,000 muffin, muffins uh, images and 2,000 uh, dog images. Cool. Then I have a nice data set. But you might see a problem here, right? There are some duplicates. Well, I just downloaded the first 2,000 hits of Google. Well, there are a lot of images being reused, resized, a little bit rotated, uh, copy pasted everywhere. So I needed to figure out a way to reduce that. So for this, I used a uh, image hash. It's just like a file hash, only it works for images. It does not care about resolution, and you can actually calculate the distance between two images to, so you can compare uh, how similar images are. So it's really nice. Uh, so I just removed all the images that are really similar. And it ended up with this. 86 images out of the 2,000. Okay. There weren't actually 2,000 images downloaded because a lot of calls were blocked because I was DDoSing a lot of sites. I downloaded maybe 1,200, 1,500 images or something. So, but it really goes to show that there is not a lot of creativity on the first few uh, websites. So how can we get a bigger data set? Because 86 images per category is not enough. So actually there is a nice image website called Flickr and it also got a lot of muffins and a lot of dark images. So. Luckily, there is a Python API for that as well. So I just used that, and I downloaded the first 250 images of that. And then I had a nice uh, image of a nice data set. 250 images for a uh, category for machine learning is not that much. But there is a way to easily overcome this. 
with uh, uh, argumenting your data set. The image that you see on the, uh, uh, on the left is the original image that uh, was downloaded, and then it was just flipped around, uh, rotated a bit, uh, maybe a little bit screwed. For us, these images are almost the same, or some of them are the same for us. But for the machine learning model, these are completely different images. It, they cannot be any different than any other dog, because it doesn't really uh, recognize this. So how can we do this? Uh, again, with our friend, uh, the little devil in, uh, in Python, we can use the uh, image dataset generator of Keras to actually do some image rotation, uh, shifting left, right, and, and zooming in and, and out. So that way I ended up with around 1,700 images per category. This is actually a good start for our machine learning model. So now it's time to build the actual model then. Well, first off, we're going to start out with a empty project in, uh, in our IntelliJ. And we're first going to import a bill of material. That's just a, a POM file with uh, all the versions already specified for the, the deep learning for, uh, for J, uh, the deep Java library. See, I messed it up. And actually, it contains all the versions and all the relevant information that we need. So I just can say I want the uh, dataset dependency. I want a model zoo because I want to use some models. Uh, and I here use the MXNet uh, model zoo. I later on switch this out for another model, but or for another engine, but doesn't really care about uh, in this stage. So then we can actually starting uh, to load the dataset. Well, that's the the thing that's going to be uh, trained on. First off, we need some uh, image folder that's uh, actually going to contain all the images uh, that I have, and I then do need to do some transformations because the model requires that every image has the same size. So I have to do some resizing. I resize to 224 by 224. And then I did another transformation to create a tensor because the model does not understand um, images. Um, it only understands tensors. And tensors are just floating points, uh, floating point numbers between 0 and 1. Images, uh, the uh, RGB values are between 0 and 220, uh, 225. So uh, that's been translated to a, a nice floating number. And then I need to do some batching. Uh, so, batch size, what's that? A batch size is just the amount of information you're going to give the machine learning model to train on um, during an entire epoch. An epoch is just a run through your entire data set, and that uh, data set is split up into iterations. And an iteration has a size of a batch size. So, in my case, I used uh, a batch size of 8, so there were a lot of iterations to uh, finish up a, a uh, epoch, and that actually gives a, us a better result. There were some benchmarks done on, uh, on, uh, on the internet, and they actually figured out that a lower batch size resulted into a better model. Because if the model sees too much information at once, it just doesn't generalize enough. So creating noise for the machine learning uh, for the model is actually better than uh, yeah, being faster. So about speed. If you downsize the uh, batch uh, uh, of the number of images inside the batch to one, it's really slow because it has to start up the entire training process for that single image. And well, you can see a nice uh, scale down and around eight to, to six in 16, it just doesn't really matter that much. So that's uh, really nice. And it actually gave me the best results uh, for this uh, for this little demo. But you do need to benchmark that uh, if you want to have the best results. Well, if we have this, uh, this little uh, code snippet, then we can just run it. And then we have a, a progress bar that just shows up. Well, just loaded the data set. Nothing, on, nothing uh, special is going on here. So then I needed to train a model. So where do we get the model then? Well, there's actually a website from uh, Kiris that lists uh, a lot of models and how accurate they are. And these accuracies are based on a data set uh, of a thousand random images. Uh, and well, they compared different models uh, against that. And you can see how fast that model trained and how fast that model was uh, uh, actually predicting images and that kind of stuff. And I took the ResNet 50 model because it has a quite high accuracy range and uh, has actually a good uh, speed. There is a one that's faster, the uh, Interceptum V3. 
but there wasn't really a model for that uh, at the time. So ResNet 50 is good enough for me for now. So how do we get that model? Well, actually quite simple. We can say to a, a ResNet V1 builder that I want to create a image shape and that image shape has uh, three, uh, three inputs. That's the red, green, and blue. Um, and then again, 224 by 224. We say the number of layers is 50 because we wanted to train a ResNet 50 uh, model. 50 just stands for the number of layers. And then we have output size. We only have a dog and a muffin, so that's two. Well, then I set the block to the model and then we can just uh, use that model. That model, you need to close that model if you finish with that model because otherwise you're gonna leak resources quite badly. Uh, so just use a try, uh, try, uh, try block for that. And then we have to add a new trainer. This trainer has some default training configuration with some soft max loss entropy loss function. We'll get to that later. Uh, we just need to add an evaluator. So that way the model actually sees how uh, good it is pro progressing and we just use accuracy to, uh, well, to, to train a model. So if, it's, if the accuracy increases, the model is happy. And we add some, some logging and uh, no executor service. Then we need to do some more uh, things. We need to add some metrics, and those metrics are just being displayed while training. So that's useful for us that we can see while training what the model is actually doing, if it's improving or getting worse. And then we just uh, initialize the trainer, again, by the 3 and 225. And then we say to the uh, easy train, um, do the fitting, so the training, on this data set and on, on our validation set. The validation set is the images that I just split out of the, the meme. And if we run this uh, application, then with the power of uh, editing, we just skipped our head three minutes or something. But we see our accuracy and our soft cross entropy loss. So what are those? Well, accuracy is just the number of images that it guessed correctly. It's just a simple yes or no. It's quite easy. But the entropy loss is kind of a function how far away the model predicted it from the actual thing. So you want a loss function of a loss result of a low as num a lowest number as possible. So a loss of zero uh, means that you have an exact match and 100% uh, well, guarantee that it was the correct thing. So entropy loss is actually more valuable to us than the accuracy because it can guess correctly, but it might just think, well, maybe coin toss and that's, well, that's about it. And with entropy loss, it also takes in the probability that the, the image was the actual thing. So if it thinks it's probable 20%, well, if we train the model a little bit further and we say that the probability is 80%, then the loss function will go down. So a lower loss function is better than a higher. So if we run this, then, well, after a bit, we get a uh, accuracy of 81%. Uh, for the training uh, data set, and our validation uh, data set is 56% uh, accurate. Okay, just train one epoch, cool. Well, if I run this again, then I have different results. Namely, 79% and uh, for the validation result, 69%. So, how comes? Well, there is actually a random seed being used to uh, fill up the model and do the uh, uh, well, training with that. So if you have a random number to begin with, then well, every time you run this, uh, this epoch, you get different results. So I really don't want that. So what you can do is just say to the engine dot set random seed to, for example, 42, uh, and then it will always spit out the same results. So keep that in mind. So when we train the model, that's fine, but now we need to save it somewhere. Just call model.save and well, it saves the model to a, a disk. But then you need to save the labels as well because the model does not contain the labels um, uh, for that specific model. So yeah, I just created a uh, separated file uh, with all the models in there. So that was quite useful and uh, also quite informative for me because I thought that the labels were inside the model and that's not the case. So what does it look like? If we run this, we got a uh, parameters file and our sysnet text uh, which contains our labels. 
So you also need the correct labels for a specific model. If you train a model again, then the labels could be in a different order. So you can't really reuse the same uh, labels again. So, and with that, we're done with the training. But now we want to use it, right? Well, it's quite easy. We can just copy paste this code that we already had. We need to create the model again, because the model is just like a scaffolding. A scaffolding to build the, uh, the, the actual model that is going on later on. And then we're going to load up the parameters that we have saved before. So the model is the, the scaffolding, and then we load up the, the content in that. Just to copy paste what we had before. And then we need to do some translation because, well, when we were training, we did some uh, transformation as well. We resized it, we had a uh, two tensor, so we need to do that as well again. And then we can call the uh, new predictor on the model, and then we can give it just a image, uh, which is actually loaded from, from, uh, from disk. In this case, this, uh, this muffin. And then we get a classification out of the predictor. And then we can uh, print out the top K, and the top K is the, the, the first result that it uh, thinks, the best result. And in this case, it thinks that it is a muffin with 74%. Uh, so, I'm happy with that. So, if we run all the images, we can create something called a classification matrix. On the left side, we see the things that we are supposed to be having, and on the top, we see the things that it thought it was. So, for the muffin, it guessed incorrectly three times, and for the uh, dog, uh, only once. You can see the image that it uh, guessed incorrectly. So let's make things better, because this is not the thing that I want to end up with, uh, and especially not with my Lego, which is a low accuracy. So if we run the, the epochs a little bit further, I done here a 20 epochs, and then trace out the, uh, the actual accuracy of the validation we can see that on epoch 4, we have the best results. And then it drops down uh, uh, considerably. So we get to that uh, uh, in a bit. But we actually want to stop training when we have had a good result and we're not improving anymore. So in Python, there is something called early stopping. And with the uh, library, there is a uh, issue open since 2020 uh, that describes early stopping. And it's actually quite useful, uh, and this, well, wasn't implemented yet. But luckily, this uh, issue contains a little bit of code. And with some copy-pasting, uh, I created my own early stopping fit. And well, with this, I can say, okay, I want to train for a maximum of 20 epochs. And uh, if a success ratio of uh, one, uh, 0 0.2 is, is reached, so a, function of a loss function of 0 0.2, that's actually really good. Uh, then you can stop or uh, yeah, train for at least three epochs and with a maximum duration in minutes because I don't want to uh, overpay Amazon with the uh, GPU things. And I want to stop if the improvement is less than 1% and do at least three uh, epochs. Well, and with that, I can add a, a callback. That's just a callback for every epoch. Then, uh, then I can save the, the model uh, that it's been trained on. Because at the end of the uh, normal training, you saved the last model that you trained. And that could be worse than the previous model that you had. So I would just want to save all the models to disk and then pick out the best, uh, best later on. So how does it come that it got worse, right? It's a bit, a bit annoying. It's a little bit like this, this game that you might play before. It's, it's a little bit of like whack-a-mole. You have to hit spacebar exactly at the right time on the most green. Well. For you, this might be easy because you can see where the best green part is. But for the machine learning model, it just only sees when it hits base. It sees that it is green. But it does not know if it can get any better or greener than this. So the machine learning model is actually not figuring out this by step, by little step by step, but taking big leaps uh, into, the, uh, in, into, the, uh, uh, in, into the train. And it might skip over the best thing. So what you actually want to do is uh, yeah, quiet down the, 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 the learning. So first you want to create big steps and go towards the green. But then if you go back, you want to create if you go back a little bit, not by as much because then you end up at the same point. So this is a learning rate of a uh, square root. 
Uh, but they are actually mathemat math mathematicians that did some better uh, uh, algorithms. And I can just add a optimizer to my training uh, configuration and I say I want the atom optimizer. This is the widely used uh, optimizer. Um, well, uh, for me, it gave the best results as well. And with that uh, optimizer implemented and with at least, uh, well, uh, doing 20 epochs and then figuring out the best uh, model, I got a uh, well, only one image wrong. So, that's good enough for me. I can work with that. It doesn't need to be perfect, but... So, what can we do to improve a little bit further? Well, we can do something about uh, transfer learning. We can create a, use a model that has been already been trained, because the first layers contains probably the, uh, the reduction of noise and uh, boundary separation and all, all that uh, kind of stuff. And it's just the same for every model. Well, what we can do is just lock in the first layers and then only the last two layers we want to train. This goes a lot faster, um, but for me it really didn't work that well. Uh, my accuracy dropped down to uh, to 50%, so it's a little bit of shame. But if you want to use this, it's just like a Hibernate Criteria API. Yeah, you can say, okay, I want to do some uh, image classification and um, I want to insert a type image and I want the classification out uh, and it needs to be an of an artifact ID with ResNet and it has to be 50 layers and uh, a specific flavor. And then it will download the actual model from the internet and then you can yeah, use that. But then you have to go into the depth of uh, machine learning. You do need to uh, get a block, remove the blocks, uh, add a new block to it and uh, all the nitty gritty details. Uh, just want to show the example that you can do this, but it requires some uh, inside knowledge about how the actual machine learning needs to be done. But on this way, you can also build up an entire model yourself if you want to do that. So we can also use Python and Java together because we are using the same engine. So if there is a data scientist that actually created the model in Python, we can actually also use that model in Java. So how do we need to do this? It's quite easy. We just need to add four lines in Python code. Uh, and probably you have already got the uh, first two lines because uh, those are imports for your uh, training as well. But you need to, uh, in this case, load up a flower model and then we can save the model to a saved model. Uh, it's an open standard for machine learning models. And this is the actual model that the uh, deep Java library can actually use. So how can we use this? Well, first off, we need to add the TensorFlow engine because we didn't have that already. And then we use the same criteria API that we used before for the entire model, but this in this time, we just have the model on disk. So we point to the location on disk. And we say to the uh, uh, criteria API that is also a TensorFlow uh, model. And then we can use the same code that we used before. Uh, only in this case, I needed to change the uh, a resize to 150 by 150 because that is what the model was trained for. And just use the exact same code, only in this case I needed to feed it a flower and not a dog or muffin. And if we run this, well, first of all, it will download TensorFlow if you not uh, have done this already. You can actually point to a TensorFlow installation of if you have a TensorFlow already installed on your disk. And in the end, we get a, uh, a daisy with a same probability. Um, well. This way we can just use uh, the Python uh, stuff in, inside uh, Java. So it's really uh, a, a good thing. But what about Lego then? Well, I actually wanted to build something uh, with a conveyor belt. And uh, well, a brick starts at the, the left side, passes through a camera. And on the top left, you see the camera feed. And at the end, there are three uh, bags or three buckets. One bucket for the correct identified bricks, one bucket for the maybe bricks, because well, maybe it's different color or that kind of thing, and a straight ahead for the, this is not a correct brick, or I didn't recognize anything. So if you run this, we can uh, see a brick appear, and then, well, it's in the right bucket. So I just can't go to the internet and download every single uh, Im image for, uh, for Lego. There is not a valid Lego dataset out there. So I need to create my own. So I wanted to, to generate uh, this, uh, this set. 
And for that, I use the Rebreakable database. It's a database that's online available, and you can actually download it in uh, CSV files, which contains all the bricks and all the sets, and, w and uh, which sets contain which bricks, and which bricks are uh, derived from other bricks and that kind of stuff. Because if you put on a sticker, it becomes a different brick. But, well, at the base level, it's just the base brick. And I just wanted to have the base bricks. Um, to figure that one out, I needed to have to, to go through the data set of the to the data set of the rebreakable data database and figure out uh, which ones uh, I need. But then there is a uh, cat library online which contains a cat file of every Lego brick. That's cool. And then there is a LD view image uh, processor that contains of can use those cat models and create actual images out of them. And it can export it to a program called Poveray. And Poveray is a application that's doing uh, ray tracing uh, and image generation or image rendering uh, uh, on the command line. So that's really useful as well. And with that, I get a, a brick out of it. Uh, next slide contains flashing images, so be warned. If I run this, I get all kinds of different angles because I just want to create all possible angles that, that a brick can be in. This probably over uh, engineered because, well, if it lands on the uh, conveyor belt, it will always face a face and not be uh, pointing in a weird angle, for example. But then you use OpenCV to figure out where the brick was. Uh, and when I know where the brick is, I can create a little rectangle uh, 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 behind that. And I just can crop it out and, well, use the uh, 224 by 224 image uh, that. Uh, uh, that goes into the model. But that I came into a little experiment. What is going to be f better for the model? If I zoom into the uh, Lego brick uh, as close as possible, or if I always stay on this fixed position? That way the model can use the actual size of the uh, brick uh, to enhance his, his, uh, uh, well, his, guess, uh, his guesswork. What do you guys think? Who thinks zooming in is better? Almost no one. Two, three hints. Who thinks is zooming out is better? Okay, a lot of people are asleep. Um, but <laughs> almost more than half the, the room thinks uh, zooming out is better to give the model the actual information that it's, it's going to need. Actually, this was false for me because the zoomed in model was around 80% accurate and the zoomed out model was 65% accurate. And it was all, uh, it was all again, harder to create those images because uh, I need to fix the camera position and do some calculations in, in that as well. So zooming in was, for me, easier, and it resulted in a better uh, recognition. And that's because the uh, model, of the, the ResNet model, is used for image uh, recognition or object uh, categorization. And, well, it was not ever uh, invented to use size with that. It just, well, a thing. And the thing does not have a size because, well, it's always different angle or different uh, 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 distance from the from the camera. So with that, I just use the zoomed in model, uh, and then I could use the dog versus uh, muffin uh, uh, code that I had before. Just change the two into the actual number that I wanted. For example, 100 here, uh, and 100 took nine hours to train on the GPU. So actually, for the next things, I used only 10 or 5 uh, bricks. But if I do this for 75 uh, epochs, with, in this case, 10 bricks, um, the training model ended up with 86%. So that's cool. So I quickly grabbed my phone and camera at some, uh, some bricks that I had laying around. I only got three bricks, but yeah, well, for the, for the, for the uh, case here. So I plotted this, and it's stayed around 33%, right? It's three bricks, 33%. What's going on here? Well, I just said it was always the same brick. <laughs> then it got the highest accuracy. So this is not really that thing, uh, thing that I wanted. Um, and on a later epoch, got a little bit better, start guessing other bricks, but, well, didn't really increase the accuracy as well. So everything went to a little bit to to crap, just like dropping your Lego uh, on the ground. <laughs> so a little bit of panic started out. So we needed to figure out what's going on. 
Well, actually, if you look at the images that I generated, those are the top ones, and look at the, uh, the images that actually from the camera, they are completely different, to me at least. And if they are completely different to me, then it's also completely different to the model. If you can see, there are jagged edges uh, around there, and well, it just looks different. So I went to into the uh, improvement mode, and I actually did some uh, some baselining with uh, five images. So I actually uh, built out the prototype uh, that you saw before, that the, the with the, the camera feed. Took five images from that, and it's well, it got 20 percent. So then I increased the uh, resolution of the generated images, and it went to 25%. So it actually started to do something. So that's good. But then I noticed that all the images were in color, and I don't care about color, I just want to know which brick it is. And the color I can get from OpenCV later on. So that's not really a problem. So I just fed it into uh, a grayscale image. So I needed to change the code a little bit, of course, I needed to change the shape because there are no uh, red, green, and blue anymore. There's just a grayscale uh, channel. And I needed to uh, say to the uh, dataset folder that it needs to load the images on grayscale. Well, actually, if you look at the performance, it also increased. Not by as much as I expected because I took away two-thirds of the inputs for the model. But, well, uh, it still needed to do a lot of things. and. In the first few layers, a lot of information is stripped, and well, it, so I get a little bit of speed gain, but not as much as, uh, as I expected. But seven percent is still a win, and the model got actually better with this. So the red, green, and blue were just uh, well confusing for the model. So then somebody came up to me uh, after DevOps UK, and he said, "Well, maybe you needed to lower your uh, contrast because the real images have shadows, and if you lower your contrast, then the uh, shadow will uh, be less or even be gone." So we did that with the validation uh, set, and it got to 31 percent. So another improvement. So there's a trend line here; it's going better. So I also removed the same contrast for the uh, uh, for the entire training set as well. So then we have the same inputs, a little bit better again, not by much, but take anything here. Then we can do some horizontal and vertical flipping in the uh, data set. So what's that? Well, we had some transformation like resize, but those transformation are actually a pipeline that's being executed for every uh, iteration that the, uh, that the, the training is running on. So I was doing resizes to 224 by 224 every single time, but my output images were also 224 by 224. So if you have your data set as, as the same size as you uh, want, you don't need to do the resizing here. It actually saves two seconds, uh, I guess, uh, per epoch. So it's also a nice improvement. But as this is a pipeline that's being executed every time, we can do some uh, transformation on the images that's going on in, in the training. So we can do some flip uh, left and right and flip top to bottom. So the images are just uh, screwed around. And this way I get a much larger data set. So with that, um, uh, it, it got better. So it got to 33%. And then I reduced the, uh, the data set to, two, uh, to 750 because I wanted to add it some real images. And I don't want to create a thousand real images. I just had uh, about 100 real images uh, from playing around. So I wanted to reduce the data set so that the uh, actual images proportion were uh, greater. So if I add 100 images to the uh, uh, 1700 uh, data set, then just a small uh, percentage. But when I added around 100 images to the 750 uh, generated images, my model shot up to 97%. So. The model of this story is, if you train on fake data, it can get a little bit better, but well, you need to add actual images that there will be, be processed or uh, things from the real world. You, I can't really generate those images close enough. I'm not an uh, a engineer that uses Puffer very, very well. So adding those real images increased the accuracy to an acceptable level. And when I run this 
to the uh, same thing that I showed before. Uh, on the left side, you see the uh, prediction coming, and on the right side, you see the, uh, uh, the brick. So we see a lot of 301s, but we saw a little 304 is in there. So if I filter out all the good ones, um, there are actually only five frames that is uh, had guessed incorrectly. Well, I get 60 frames uh, if the image passes through that camera in, uh, in two seconds. So with this, um, I can just take whatever is the uh, highest number of, of, of bricks that it uh, figured out. And also, the probability of those bricks that it guessed incorrectly were also all below 80, uh, 85%. So I can just say, ignore every prediction that has a probability less than 90%, and then it would guess 100% correctly. And with this, I have an actual good model that actually can uh, continue on and actually build the actual sorter. But that's for later, maybe next year. So the takeaways of this, uh, this talk is uh, that Java can be used for machine learning. And actually, it's a little bit faster than Python if you, if you want. Python has a bigger ecosystem, so the, the, the data engineers, uh, they, are, they are using Python a lot more and they know it better. So they still can use Python uh, because, well, we can use those Python models in Java. With that, my name is Jago de Vrede. You can follow me on uh, Twitter on or the variable name X. Uh, these are the links to the uh, actual projects uh, on GitHub. I know there is a typo in Benchmark, but it's on a lot of slides and don't really want to go back fixing that. Uh, and you can find the uh, slides on uh, SlideShare, and I will tweet that later on. So with that, I would like to thank you.